In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at how to use assets created using photo scanning techniques in conjunction with Forest Pack. We'll be using Megascans content, which is high quality and includes a really handy bridge application for converting and importing content to 3ds Max, but materials created yourself or from other suppliers should work equally well with these procedures. We'll look at how to use surfaces, import and use photogrammetry models, and prepare 3D assets from texture atlases. In the process, we'll demonstrate how a woodland scene can be created by layering 10 forest pack objects and look at the key settings used to control each one of them. Even if you don't use Megascans, many of the principles will be useful for your scenes. A quick note about the assets used. There's only a single tree used in this scene, and it's the sample model from Evermotion's AM163 collection of trees, all of which feature detailed photo scan trunks. If you want to use that particular asset, you can download the model free from their website, otherwise you could use any other tree model. Also, for licensing reasons, the Megascans content isn't supplied with the downloads for this tutorial, so again, if you want to follow along, you'll either need a Megascans account, or you can substitute some of the materials we use for content from the free samples section of the Megascans library. Alternatively, you can use assets found from anywhere else. Megascans organise their assets into four categories, surfaces, atlases, 3D objects, and a new range of 3D plants. We'll take a look at each of these in turn as we build up a small woodland scene. Here's how the environment looks before we add any scattered assets. It's pretty basic. We only have a couple of terrains, one with a footpath, plus a building to work with. In order to scatter some of the objects, we're going to need one more thing though, a spline that follows the footpath that we'll use to drive nearly all of the forest pack objects. You can easily extract one from the terrain geometry by selecting an edge from the middle of the path and clicking loop to select a center line the entire length. Click on create shape from selection and use the default settings to generate the spline. As well as being invaluable for forest pack, this spline also offers us the opportunity to apply a separate material to the footpath area by using a distance map. This will work by applying a material based on the surface's proximity to the spline we just created. In this video we're going to be using V-Ray, but Corona and other renderers also have this feature. For a distance map to work though, the spline needs to be a mesh object, so select it, go to the rendering rollout and turn on Enable in Viewport. Make sure you leave Enable in Render turned off, otherwise you'll see the spline in the final image. The thickness can be left quite small, because it's the distance from this spline that really matters. As you can see from the original render, in this scene there's already a simple material applied to the surface that's using a couple of Megascans materials mixed together using a noise map. But now we'll add a third just for that path. First of all, we'll check the existing material. If I open the material editor and pick the material from the train, you can see that there's a couple of surface materials already applied, mixed, as I say, using a noise map in a V-Ray blend material. Let's add a third material to this from the Megascans collection. So to import a surface material to 3ds Max, you use the Megascans bridge. All you need to do is select the surface you wish to use, go to the scripts drop down in the top right hand corner, and select Max, then send to V-Ray. Or use a different preset if you're using a different renderer. From the export options, you then choose the resolution and the format, as well as whether to copy the images to another folder. Generally, we turn on use images from source folder and leave them where they are. Then click Export. If you switch back to Max, you'll find that this new material has been added to the next available sample slot ready to use. You can now add this to the existing V-Ray blend material, wiring it to the next available coat input. Now we need to mask this out to reveal the material only on the footpath. To do this, create a new V-Ray distance texture map and wire it to the appropriate blend input. In the V-Ray Distance Texture settings, go to the Objects rollout, click on Add, and pick the spline we just created from the scene. Change the far colour to black, and the near and inside colour to white. This will create a black and white mask that reveals the material only in the areas close to the spline. And finally, to control how far either side of the spline this material will show, increase the distance value. A setting of 200 works in this scene, but you'll need to experiment for your own. And if you render now, you'll see the new material only where the path is. And because this is determined by spline, you can easily edit the direction of the path and the textures will update automatically too. Now with some basic materials applied, we're ready to start adding scattered objects. And we'll start with the biggest objects, the trees. So create a new forest pack object by clicking on the terrain. 
go to the surfaces rollout and add the background terrain as well. This second surface slopes away from the scene and just fills out the background to hide the horizon. Go to the geometry rollout, select the existing scatter item and change the mode to custom object. Click on the object picker button and choose the tree model from the scene. If a warning appears about optimizing forest pack for high resolution geometry, just accept the suggestions. To randomize the tree, go to the transform rollout and enable translation, rotation and scale. You can leave these at their default settings except for scale, which will change to a minimum value of 150% and a maximum value of 300%. This will significantly increase the size of the trees and also add a lot of variation. The trees are currently on both the path and intersecting the building. To remove them from these areas, go to the areas rollout and click add spline area. Select the footpath spline that we created earlier and change the mode to exclude. Increase the thickness value to remove trees from the footpath and surrounding area. And then to remove trees from the building, click to add an object area and pick the building from the scene. If you want to change the distance around the building that trees can be scattered, use the scale parameter. To increase the accuracy of the collision detection, increase the resolution. Internally, Forest Pack creates a black and white mask by projecting exclude objects on the world's Z axis. So to control the number and spacing of these trees, go to the distribution map rollout and change the density to about 19,000 centimeters. You can also, of course, judge this by eye. Feel free also to use the X and Y offset values to slide the distribution map around on the surface to fine tune the scatter. And then finally, if you want to perfect the layout of the trees, you can enter custom edit mode from the tree editor rollout. This mode allows you to transform, add and delete individual objects. When you activate it, you'll get a couple of warnings. Firstly, that you're disabling distribution mode, essentially baking the trees into place. And secondly, asking if you want to make visible any trees that have been removed because they're outside the camera view. In this case, the camera is fixed, so we'll leave them hidden. We'll remove some trees from the mid-ground that are obscuring the building just by selecting and deleting them. One of the great advantages of photogrammetry is its ability to acquire highly realistic 3D assets. In this section we'll demonstrate how to import them using Megascan's bridge and set up scatters using Forest Pack to add twigs, branches, trunks and fallen trees in and around the path. The import process for 3D objects though is very similar to surfaces. Once you've downloaded your assets from the Megascans website, you just open Megascans Bridge. Select the model you wish to import, go to the scripts drop down and select Max, then send to V-Ray, or the preset for whatever renderer you're using. From the export menus, you can now choose the LOD, texture resolution, and the format, as well as whether to copy the images to another folder. In these examples, we're going to use LOD0 to reduce memory usage, but if you have a powerful system, you can go for the high poly versions. Click export and the file will automatically be imported into 3ds Max. Materials are created from the maps and automatically applied. Go through this same process for all the 3D models you wish to import. We're going to add a standing dead tree, a tree stump, a fallen tree and some rocks. Hero models like this would typically be manually placed. But even so, it's worth adding them to a forest pack object. In that way, you'll benefit from improvements in memory management and render speed, as well as Forest Pack's transform and texture randomization features should you want to use them. So to use Forest Pack to manually position objects, when you're creating it, change the mode to custom edit. In this mode, you click in the scene to manually place a single object. At this point, it will appear as a billboard as we've yet to add any geometry. So go to the geometry rollout, select the existing item and change the mode to custom object. Pick one of the objects we just imported from Megascan's bridge. Then repeat the process for all the other items. When you're done, we're ready to start positioning the objects in the scene, which you do by going to the tree editor rollout and clicking on the tree symbol to enter sub-object level. Below this is the add items group. Click on add and start clicking in the scene to add items. You can choose which items to place just using the drop down menu. Once an item is placed, you can use Max's standard Rotate, Transform and Scale tools to place them exactly where you need them. We added some rocks around the path, a couple of tree stumps in the foreground and some dead leaves. You can also clone objects in this mode by holding down Shift as you transform them. 
We won't show this entire process in the video because it's basically the same as positioning manually. So we're going to move on now to adding some fallen branches across most of the terrain. The Megascans library includes many assets that are designed specifically for scattering. Here we're going to scatter some branches amongst the undergrowth and then some twigs on the path. Importing a Megascan scatter object is really no different from importing hero objects. Just select an asset in Megascans bridge and use the export scripts to take care of the rest. The only difference here is that you'll end up with several objects inside Max instead of just a single one. So to use these, create a new forest pack object using again the terrain as a surface. Change the surface normal slider to zero this time. In that way the objects will rotate to follow the geometry and it will reduce interpenetration with the terrain. Now go to the geometry rollout, click on the button to add multiple objects. An object select window opens and here you need to find all the branch objects we just imported, select them and click add. Then change the color ID of all the items to the same color. We'll use this later in the distribution settings. Add a new item and set it to disabled. This will add spaces in the scatter and when used in conjunction with the clusters feature it can add gaps in the distribution where there are no branches. Now let's randomize these objects. Go to the transform rollout and turn on translation, rotation and scale. Leave the translation settings at their defaults. Zero the X rotation properties to stop the branches rotating through the surface and then change the scale to 40% minimum and 200% maximum to introduce a much wider range of sizes. For further randomness, you can enable horizontal mirroring. So these branches are going to be a bit of a trip hazard. We need to remove them from the path. Go to the areas rollout and add a new shape area. Pick the footpaths line from the scene and set the mode to exclude. Increase the thickness property until the branches are cleared from the middle of the path. Ideally, you'll want to be able to see them at the edges, but keep the majority of the path clear. In the distribution rollout, change the density to 950 centimeters until you have the desired coverage of branches. At the moment, as you can see, the distribution is pretty uniform across the whole area. We'd like to add some patches where no branches appear, and to do this, we use the clusters feature. This allows you to group together plants to have the same color ID. Remember, all these branches have been assigned a single color ID, and a disabled item has a second, different color ID. What this means is that we can create gaps in the scatter by creating a cluster of disabled items. To do this, enable diversity clusters and change the size to approximately 100 centimeters. And then finally, to change the ratio of the clusters, you can use the probability settings found in the geometry rollout. For example, selecting all of the branch objects and reducing their probability will result in more gaps appearing in the scatter and a more convincing broken up distribution. With the large branches complete, we'll add some small twigs to the path. The procedure is more or less the same. Download and select a twig asset in Megascans Bridge and use the built-in export scripts to transfer these models to Max. Create a new forest pack object using the train as a surface and change the surface normal slider to zero. Go to the geometry rollout, click on the button to add multiple objects and then pick all the twig objects and select add. Select all of the items in the list and give them the same color ID. Set their probability to 5%. This is to allow us to use the same clustering trick we just demonstrated. And then add a new item and set it to disabled. This one you can leave the probability 100% and this will create more gaps in the clusters. Currently we're scattering on the whole surface but realistically we'll only ever see the debris on the path. So to achieve this turn off the existing surface and add a new shape area. Pick the footpath spline from the scene and increase the thickness until the twigs overlap the sides of the path. About 205 centimeters works well in this example. Rather than stop abruptly as the twigs disappear into the undergrowth, it would be better if their density gradually decreased. To do that, enable fall off density and increase the include value to about 70 centimeters. By default, this feature uses a linear falloff graph to adjust the density based on the scattered item's distance from the perimeter of an area. As we'll see later, these graphs can also be edited to create more sophisticated effects. And now we'll change the global density. Go to the distribution map rollout and change the map to groups one. This will give us little clumps of twigs instead of the usual even distribution. Then decrease the density to about 100 centimeters to add more twigs and turn on clusters. Reduce the size of the clusters to 50 centimeters. 
You can also change the shape of the shape clusters using this roughness setting. If you increase this, it will make the cluster shapes more angular. When scattering thousands of small objects like this, it's a good idea to optimize the scene by reducing the number of scattered items based on their distance from the camera. Often these smaller objects are not even visible in the background, so it makes no sense to waste resources on them. Forest Pack has several techniques for culling geometry based on the camera view, and so these following techniques can be used for most of the ground cover scatters in this scene. So to optimize, go to the camera rollout, click on the camera picker, and select a camera from the scene. By default, this will remove any objects that are not visible in the render. If you need to, you can adjust the far clipping plane, expand the camera thrust stem slightly, as well as add offset in case you would like any objects to render slightly behind the camera. This can be useful for ensuring that scattered items appear in reflections and cast shadows. The far clipping plane stops the scatter abruptly, but we can reduce the visibility of this if we gradually thin out. To do this, use the distance fall off settings. Turn on density, set a minimum and a maximum value, and the number of scattered items will dissolve to nothing over this distance. The Megascans library also includes atlases, these are cutout textures with an opacity map, fantastic for creating leaves and modelling plants. They don't include a 3D model though, so we need to do a bit of work before we can use them with Forest Pack. There are already a few tutorials published about this process that either hand trace the atlases with splines or use ZBrush. We'll demonstrate a slightly different approach that uses an application called Sprite UV. This is an easy to use, free or inexpensive tool that was originally designed for packing sprites, UVs and textures but it's also ideal for automatically generating meshes that match the shapes contained in an atlas. To illustrate how this works, we'll take this leaf material and create 3D models that are ready to be used with Forest Pack and GrowFX. So in Megascan's bridge, select an atlas texture and export it to 3ds Max using the built-in script in the usual way. At the end of this export process, as well as placing the materials in 3D Studio Max's material editor, Explorer opens the folder containing all the maps. This is handy because we need to generate a map with an alpha channel for Sprite UV to work, and the easiest way to do this is to open the opacity map in Photoshop, or your chosen image editing software, and cut out the background so you're left with only the leaves. Before saving, reduce the resolution of the texture to 1K. This size is a limitation of the free version of Sprite UV, but of course, if you buy the full license of Sprite UV, any size is OK. You just need to be aware that larger resolutions will slightly increase processing time. So save the new map as a PNG, PSD, Tier 4 and other format that supports transparency. Open Sprite UV and import the map either by dragging it to the window or by clicking to open the file browser. First of all, you'll need to set a couple of save paths in Sprite UV. On the menu on the left hand side, select the Atlas List Export Atlas options. We're not actually going to be exporting a texture, but you still need to set a path in order to build the mesh. In Output Path, select a location to save your files. Next, go to the Mesh Export Group and Mesh Export options. Set a path and assign a file name. The other important setting here is the pixel per unit value. This is how the size of the resultant mesh is determined. The size of the mesh will be the resolution of the texture divided by this value. For example, if my scene units are set to centimeters, my opacity map is 1024 by 1024, and the pixel per unit is set to 100, the default, then the size of the model when exported into max will be 1024 divided by 100, or 10.24 centimeters. We'll use this measurement to set the size of the UV map later, as we'll see. Now we can configure the mesh itself. Go to the mesh format FBX settings and change the up vector to Z, and then turn on flip Z. Now we're ready to create the mesh. Go to the Atlas item settings and you'll see a preview of the output. There are only a couple of settings here we need to worry about. Offset, which adds padding around each leaf, and Alpha Cutoff, which is a threshold used to detect the edge of each leaf. We tend to get our mesh as close as possible to the texture to reduce the amount of transparency in the final render. This can really slow down renders in some circumstances. To get the mesh tighter, reduce the offset value and increase the alpha cutoff. And when you're happy with the results, turn on export mesh only and click build. A new FBX file will be created in your save location. And that's it for the sprite UV section. All that remains is to import the FBX into 3ds Max, adjust the UVs, apply materials and make a few other small changes.
So import the FBX file in 3ds Max. For some reason when viewed from above the object is upside down so immediately rotate it around the Z axis by 180 degrees and then reset the X form. Apply the material we've already imported from Megascan's bridge. If you show the diffuse texture in the viewports you'll notice that the UVWs haven't actually been calculated so we need to add them ourselves. Fortunately it's very easy. Apply a UVW modifier to the leaves. Set the size to 10.24 cm by 10.24 cm. You'll remember from earlier that this size was calculated by dividing the resolution of the original map by the pixel per unit value specified in Sprite UV. Go to the gizmo subobject level and use the align tool to align the gizmo to the leaf object's pivot. Your textures are now perfectly aligned to the mesh. We now need to increase the resolution of the mesh so that it can be deformed. Add a subdivide modifier and decrease the size to get the required resolution. And now to add the deformation to the leaf so they're not flat, we could use a bend modifier or even add some noise, but why not use the displacement map that comes with the material? So add a displacement modifier and make sure you turn on Use Existing Mapping. Copy the displacement map to the modifier's bitmap input, increase the strength until you're happy with the amount of displacement. And then add a smooth modifier and turn on Auto Smooth to finish up. Our leaves are done and you can collapse the stack. All that remains is to detach each leaf into separate objects and then align their pivots. You can detach each leaf manually by selecting each element and using the Edit Poly Detach option, or you can use one of the many, many scripts that are available to automate this process. We have wrapper tools installed already here, so we can simply use the Explode Object option to speed up this process. The leaves are now separate objects, but you'll need to align the pivot for each one. Once again, you could do this manually by going to the hierarchy rollout, activating effect pivot only and then moving the pivot, or you can use a script. So we're using wrapper tools again to align the pivot to the center and then to the bottom of the leaves. Now we've got all our leaves separated, separated, we can select the ones we wish to keep and delete any extras or other bits of the original atlas we don't want to scatter. To make it a bit easier to identify these leaves in Forest Pack, we should rename them. So launch Max's built-in rename objects tool found in the edit menu. Select all the green leaves and then enter the color of the leaf in the rename tools prefix field. Enter leaves in the base name field and turn on numbered. Click rename to update the names of these selected objects. And then do the same thing for the yellow leaves and then the brown ones. Finally, uniformly scale the leaves until they are the correct size. Reset the X form and then collapse them to an editable polygon object and they are now ready to scatter. So to apply these leaves to our path, we'll have a new forest pack object applied to the terrain. In the surfaces rollout, once again set the direction to zero and then add the leaves in the geometry rollout. Change the color ID of all the leaves so that they are identical. We're going to employ the same clustering trick to add gaps to the distribution we've used in the previous examples. But this time we need to get the mix of the leaves right. Since these leaves are dead, they should mainly be brown with occasional greens and yellows. To achieve this, select all of the brown leaves and set their probability to 50%. Then select the yellow leaves and set the probability much lower to 2.5%. And finally we want very few green leaves, so set their probability really low, about half a percent. And then to create gaps in the scatter, add a new item and set it to disabled. Make sure it has a separate color ID from the leaves so that the cluster features work correctly and leave the probability at 100%. Now we can randomize these leaves by going to the transform rollout and enabling translation, rotation and scale. And we'll set the translations minimum to minus 200% and maximum to 200% for the X and the Y axis to break up the distribution a bit. Set the rotation's minimum value to minus 20 and maximum to 20% for the X and the Y axis and increase the range between the scales minimum and maximum for more variety in the leaf size. At the moment we're scattering on the entire terrain but we only want individual leaves on the path. We'll fill the terrain with larger patches in the next section. To confine the scatter to just this area, go to the areas rollout and turn off the surface area. Add a new shape area and pick the footpath spline. Increase the size until the leaves cover the width of the path and up the sides as well. About 1.8 meters works well. Looking at the model of the path, there's actually a dip in the middle where you'd expect more leaves to accumulate. So to create this effect, you can use custom fall off curves. Enable density fall off and click the edit curve button and a graph opens. 
The x size represents the distance from the edge, with the edge being on the right hand side of the graph. The y size represents the density. Therefore, to create more leaves in the center and at the edge, you should create a graph which has a dip in the middle, like this. You can now change the include distance to set the range over which this graph is calculated. I used about 140 centimeters, but you can adjust it visually. The distribution settings are very similar to the ones we use for the twigs. Again, choosing the groups one map and increasing the number of leaves by reducing the density setting. Then turn on diversity clusters and set the size to about 150 centimeters to create some decent sized gaps in the scatter. And then make the clusters more ragged by increasing the roughness value and blend the boundaries as well between clusters by increasing the blurry edge value. You'll now have leaves that follow the path with a greater density at the center of the path and at the edge, broken with an occasional gap. To fill larger areas, we normally make patches of leaves. In a previous tutorial, we've shown how you can make those patches with forest pack, but for objects like this that ideally should overlap and lay on top of one another, it's hard to get a convincing stacking effect. Instead, we like to use mass effects to create a more believable pile of leaves that can then be scattered with forest pack to fill large areas. Here's how. Create a forest pack object to scatter the leaves using more or less the same techniques as the previous example. Remember to change your probability settings to get the correct mix of colors and ages. In this example, I'm going to assume this has already been done. Apply the forest object to a small circle, about 15 centimeters works well. Go to the transform rollout and enable transform rotation and scale and use the default settings. Except for Z transform, increase this significantly until the leaves are well spread out on the Z axis. Adjust the density too if necessary. Next, we need to convert the forest object to native max instances. To do this, go to the utilities panel, click on more and load forest tools. Change the mode to individual objects and uncheck freeze and boxes. Click instantiate and the leaves will be created in the scene as individual items. So next we'll use physx or mass effects depending on which you have installed to drop these leaves into a pile. To do this, make sure you have the toolbar visible, select all of the original leaf source objects and click set selected as dynamic rigid bodies. Then open the mass effects tools and go to the multi object editor tab. From here we can adjust the properties of these leaves. Change the physical material bounciness value to zero to minimize the amount the leaves will spring out of the stack when they land. Then go to the simulation tools tab and press the start simulation without animation button. The leaves will drop into a pile. Once they've settled and you're happy, click capture transform to lock in the new position, select a single leaf and attach all of the others until they are once again a single object. You can use the script if you have one. I'm using wrapper tools again in this example. Reset the X form and edit the pivot and you now have a new patch ready to be scattered with forest pack. You can run this process a few times to get different variations and help disguise repetition in your scatters. So now we have a couple of large patches, we can scatter them across the rest of the terrain. Create a new forest pack object using the terrain. In the surfaces rollout, make sure you set the direction to zero. It's particularly important in this case because otherwise the edges of the patches become very obvious on sloped terrains. Go to the geometry rollout and add the leaf patches. Give them the same color ID so that we can use the clustering feature. Add a new item and set it to disabled. Add randomization by going to the transform rollout and turning on translation rotation and scale. The default settings are fine for this kind of distribution. We already have leaves on the path, so we need to exclude these patches from that part of the terrain. Do this by going to the areas rollout, add a new shape area, Set the mode to exclude and increase the thickness value until the patches are removed from the path. They should roughly connect to the existing leaves. Now change the number of patches by opening the distribution rollout and adjusting the density value. And finally turn on diversity clusters and adjust the size to add some random gaps to the distribution. The leaves of the ferns and on the saplings in this scene were created from Megascans atlases prepared in exactly the same way as this example. This time though, they were used in conjunction with GrowFX to create plants. There isn't time in this tutorial to go through the full GrowFX process, and there are several helpful tutorials on X-Level's website that can help with this if you want to learn more. But here's a couple of the most salient points. For GrowFX, the leaves should be aligned so that they point upwards, along the Z-axis. Their flat side should be pointing along the Y-axis. GrowFX objects were prepared in the usual way with paths to define the placement and the deformation of the leaves. 
and then in Grow Effects you use the Instanced Mesh Builder to add the Atlas geometry to the plant. Just like Forest Pack you have options to control the probability of items, randomise their scale and much more. If you want to deform the leaves to follow the splines, make sure that you enable Combine Meshes and Deform Along Path. In case you don't have GrowFX, we've included meshes for the saplings and the ferns in this scene file. All you need to do is import the same atlases that we used from the Megascans bridge and apply them to the models. So in this example we've shown the ferns, but we also made some saplings, and we're going to show you how to scatter those ones first. It's pretty straightforward, we just need to make sure they don't grow through the existing trees, the buildings or the footpath. So once again, create a new forest pack object from the terrain, and then go to the geometry rollout and add the sapling models. Add some randomization, um, but reduce the minimum scale a bit to create smaller trees. To remove the saplings from the path, go to the areas rollout and add a new shape area. Pick the path spline from the scene, set the mode to exclude and increase the thickness until the trees are removed from the footpath. Remove the saplings from the building by adding a new object area and picking the house from the scene. And we also want to remove saplings from around the existing trees, so you can actually add a forest area by clicking on this button and then picking the forest trees object from the scene. The collision detection though takes into consideration the tree's canopy, but we're really only interested in the trunk, so to compensate for this, reduce the scale value. Then add a second forest area and select the forest pack object used for the hero models to ensure they're not covered by the saplings either. Again, you may need to reduce the scale a little bit. And finally go to the distribution rollout and adjust the density settings until you're happy with the amount of saplings. More or less the same principle also applies to the ferns. In our scenes there are two types of ferns that we create in separate clusters alongside some gaps. So you do this in the geometry rollout where we've already added the fern models. Give the two types of ferns separate colour ID so that they'll appear in different clusters. And add also a disabled item and reduce the probability to 35%. Add randomization from the transform rollout. Change the minimum scale to 40% and the maximum to 180 for more variety in the sizes. And then we want to remove saplings from the path, so go to the areas rollout and add a new shape area. Set the mode to exclude and increase the thickness until the ferns are removed from the footpath. And add a new object area and pick the house from the scene. And add new forest areas for the trees and the hero models just like we did in the previous example. Lastly, go to the distribution rollout and adjust the density and cluster settings. To finish this tutorial, we'll look at the final category of objects in the Megascans library, 3D plants created from scan data. There are both individual plants and small patches suitable for covering large areas. In this last step, we'll add some small grass and weed models to the edge of the path to ease the transition between the dried leaves and the undergrowth. Using Megascans Bridge, import the plants you wish to scatter. The process is identical to the one for importing 3D models. In 3ds Max though, make sure the plants are aligned correctly, occasionally I find I need to rotate them and reset the X form. And create a new forest pack object from the terrain, and then add these plants to the items list and adjust probabilities if you feel the need. Add randomization by going to the transform rollout and turning on rotation and scale. The grass is a bit long as it is, so change the minimum scale to 50% and the maximum to 80%. In the areas rollout, disable the surface and add a new shape area. Pick the footpath spline and increase the thickness so that the grass extends into the undergrowth. Turn on density fall off and increase the include value to the same thickness of the path. Now we need to create some custom fall off curves. We want to remove grass from the centre of this path where we've put all the leaves previously. So to do this, open the fall off curve and create a graph that spikes on the right hand side like this. We also want the grass to decrease in size as it gets close to the centre of the path. So to do this, enable scale fall off, use a similar value for the include settings, and edit the curve in a similar way so that you have a spike on the right hand side, but so that the left hand point doesn't go all the way down to zero. And then finally open the distribution map rollout and adjust the density to get a good packed distribution of plants. So this concludes the tutorial. We've layered up 10 forest pack objects now onto one surface, each affected by a single spline so that if you wanted to adjust the path, you'd only need to edit one object. If we enable each one of these forest objects in turn, we can see how they interact. We have one forest pack object each for the twigs, the leaves on the path, the fallen branches, the patches of leaves, the grass on the side of the path, the hero models, the saplings, the ferns, and finally the trees. Although we looked at a particular scene, the principle should be easy to adapt to any other combination of splines and surfaces, as well as other types of assets. 
If you use these tutorial files or the techniques shown in this tutorial to create any variations on this scene, we'd love to see them on our forum. Otherwise, stay tuned for our next tips and tricks instalment and check out our other videos in the tutorial section of the website.